Hi everyone, thank you for coming. And thanks so much to the organizers for having me. Can you hear me all right? Great. So I'm going to be speaking about one project um, called the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan. It's a 10 month planning process that I was involved in with uh, tons of stakeholders, or stakeholder organizations in the neighborhood of East Harlem in Manhattan, in New York City. Um, before, I mean, as a way to introduce the project, I'm going to show a little two minute video clip that's in English. Um, but before I do that, um, I wanted to do the cliche New York thing and talk about Robert Moses and Jane <laughs> Um So I think that there's this polemic or um, uh, kind of division of thinking that emerged very early on in New York City between the project of Robert Moses, his large construction projects that he kind of implemented from top down, uh, and the work that Jane Jacobs did from the bottom up using grassroots organizing to stall and stop, in some cases, the work of Robert Moses and similar kind of authoritarian rural um, creators. But I think that this polemic and this uh, dialectic is an outdated one in terms of thinking about um, kind of changing roles in, in communities. I think that it's no longer a discussion of bottom up and top down. I'm really interested to talk to Michelle and David about this more in our discussion. Um, and I think what the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan will show is that there's a, a rise in this dynamic middle of people that come from architecture and design backgrounds, that used to work at agencies that now are community organizers, uh, community organizers that go to architecture and planning school and start to work for the housing authority and the planning authority. Um, and it's not, in my opinion, co-option. I think it's a radicalization, actually, of the profession and of these um, tools to be able to actually do better work. Rezoning for the purpose of preserving and creating affordable housing, precisely 200,000 units of affordable housing over the next 10 years. This is um, the agenda of Mayor Bill de Blasio and his administration. Uh, the reason why rezoning is going to be a mechanism to do this, to create this affordable housing, is because it's going to be coupled with a program called mandatory inclusionary housing. This is going to um, force developers to create between 20 to 30 percent of their units uh, at affordable levels. Now there's a lot of debate about what is affordable and that's been going on in New York and will continue to go on in New York for a long time. But it is a kind of a revolutionary change in, uh, since what's been happening in New York City up to now. Um, so you can see kind of the, the orientation of uh, Community Board 11 which is kind of co-bounded East Harlem, uh, up in northern Manhattan there. Um, this is kind of a boring diagram, but I think it's an important one to illustrate uh, how the East Harlem neighborhood plan is very different from a classic rezoning process. Uh, you see the traditional process up above, and um, it really doesn't leave a lot of room or create a lot of options very early on in the process for defining community uh, 
defined needs and community defined solutions for the problem. So what usually happens is a developer would make an application or a city agency would make an application for a zoning change to a lot or to a neighborhood. And then it would go through a uniform land use review process. And at the end, uh, this happened in the 1960s and 70s, there was inserted a set of um, public review processes that uh, people fought very hard for. And I think a lot of attention does need to be paid and thanks needs to be given to that. So there's a community board vote, a borough president vote, a city planning commission vote before it finally goes to the city council. But I think that really missing piece that the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan is trying to speak to is this one early on of what does the community mean? What is the in situ organizational need there? And what the stakeholders in East Harlem realized that they needed a self-led neighborhood plan in order to, um, to state their needs. These are some images of East Harlem. I think it's important to place yourself there being so far away right now. Um, Amazing people, amazing architecture, incredible diversity. One of the tools that, so WXY played two roles in this process. We, uh, we were facilitators, so we helped um, people speak to each other, really, and we translated complex planning and architectural concepts into easy to read maps and diagrams. Um, and another thing that we did was um, really the, the analysis and the architectural and planning um, ideation that is, is needed and that's something that community groups maybe aren't empowered to do on their own sometimes. So uh, we were funded by the Speaker of the City Council to provide these resources and this is a map that we created for the community in order for them to see the rent regulated housing stock that they uh, stood to lose over the coming 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So we actually, um, through our analysis, realized that every year for the following 15 years, they would be losing, in that neighborhood, 300 units of affordable housing annually. And this set up the problem for, for it set up a common goal and a common problem that uh, people that came with various different types of interests to be able to have a platform to advocate around. Another kind of boring slide, but really important. Um, this is the steering committee that we create, that helped we helped create. It's uh, 21 members that represent various parts of uh, um, of community groups in East Harlem. Everything from schools to unions to um, community-based organizations that provide social services, etc. There were also 12 topical subgroups that helped create the final recommendations. You can see them on your left-hand side. So everything from zoning and land use to health to seniors to open space and schools. One of the mechanisms that we used to get um, input from the community was the classic community visioning workshop. This is a really massively used tool in the United States. I think it can be done in really crappy ways and it could be done in really good ways. Um, we had an amazing partner named Hester Street Collaborative. I really encourage you to look them up. Um, and they helped plan these community visioning workshops with us. They made them really interactive, really easy to participate in. Um, and we had 1,500 people show up to a total of eight community visioning workshops. Um, the workshops were thematic, so people could come depending on the interests, particular interests that they have. A lot of people came to all of them. These are some images from those workshops. Another boring slide, but so necessary, uh, is the workflow that we helped curate and create for developing these recommendations. So there were a lot of layers of review and of ideation that uh, came to, that we brought to bear on this process. It wasn't just you went to the community visioning session and then the, present, er, the presentation was over, you put your little idea on a ticket and that was the recommendation that was put in the plan. We wanted to help the, create, the community create a plan that when the Department of City Planning got it in front of them, they were able to read and they were able to start with recommendation number one is priority number one, and recommendation 10 comes in year two, and we wanted to kind of give them a better roadmap. So we needed a really refined process to do that. So there's a kind of back and forth that happened between subgroup meetings that were topic specific, that went to community visioning workshops, back to the subgroup, 
back to the steering committee, or to the steering committee, that 21 member steering committee I was talking about, back to the subgroup. We actually helped um, these subgroups meet with agencies even before the rezoning process started, so the agencies got to get a taste of the recommendations very early on. Um, and then the steering committee actually required a two-thirds vote to approve recommendations. So it was a high threshold for approving recommendations, um, which, you know, we debated about it for a long time. Why should you vote on recommendations? But I think that there's a certain level of, like, uh, participation and kind of, like, sweat equity that you have to put in to approve these. Ultimately, we have 236 recommendations. And a big fat report that I worked very long hours to make. <laughs> um, this is an example of the zoning and land use recommendations. So again, coming from an architectural and urban design and planning background, we were able to create, uh, actually use the city's own methodology of, it's called reasonable worst case development scenario. Um, but it's a methodology that the city uses to identify which pieces of land should be densified and what kinds of uses they should have on them. So we used the city's own process, explained it very clearly to individuals that were coming to our meetings, and developed kind of our own map of where this density should go. So now there's continuing back and forth between the stakeholder committee that continues to meet and the Department of City Planning who's actually trying to put together the rezoning proposal. Their map right now, doesn't look exactly like this one, but the thing that's amazing about the plan is that these 21 members of the stakeholder committee continue to put pressure. So on, on the city planning department um, to listen to these recommendations. So, you know, I have this pretty map and this pretty diagram or whatever, and this is like the final physical product of our work. Um, but I think the two products that were most important of our work was capacity building. We built, um, we, we drew out the capacity that was already in the neighborhood and gave them a language with which to speak to their officials. Um, so I think capacity and, um, and a roadmap, right? So a way to advocate for yourself, not just in the next year or month, but a way to advocate for yourself and your community over the next 10, 20 years.